Live with a recap of AEW Dynamite, number 11, 2024, coming off the All Out pay per view this past weekend. Now, the big angle that we saw at All Out was John Moxley turning against Brian Danielson, putting the plastic bag over his head. We had a video promo from Moxley to start the show. Moxley said he did not enjoy what he did to Danielson, but according to Moxley, Danielson did not have the stomach to do what they are doing, what their mission is. Moxley said that he sees egos that are out of control. He said he's not a villain. He's not a hero either. He said he's the one true king of the lands. He said they tried Brian's way, but diplomacy failed. And now Moxley chooses violence and chooses war. More on Moxley in just a little bit. I thought the promo was fine, but to me, I'm still wanting more as to why he turned against Brian Danielson. It just seems like, well, he thinks Danielson was too weak and he had to take over and do things his own way. Doesn't really make too much sense to me, but I thought his delivery was pretty good. More on Moxley in just a little bit. Darby Allen, who Moxley has been calling out the last few weeks, he was shown arriving at the arena. We had Christian Money in the Bank contract for an AEW. He has the guaranteed world title match at any time. He came to the ring. He called Kill Switch a monster who belongs to him. The crowd was chanting Luchasaurus. Christian did not appreciate that. And he said that All Out was not the right place to cash in his contract, but he did say that Brian Danielson's days are numbered. And he referred to himself as the next undisputed AEW world champion. Promo was good, just to... Remind everyone that Christian is lurking in the shadows with his contract that is not Money in the Bank. We had Don Callis backstage with Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher, and he proposed that Will and Kyle team up together in the tag team casino gauntlet. Now, Ospreay said he's got his international title he needs to focus on, but Callis said that he did a favor for Ospreay, and now Ospreay has to do a favor for him. And then Kyle threw in that there's nobody else that he would rather win the tag team titles with, so Ospreay finally agreed to team up with him in the casino gauntlet. More on that in just a few moments. We had our first match of the show, which was the scapegoat, Jack Perry, the TNT champion. They had, or Jack Perry had a match against Leo Rush. Now, Action Andretti was out there with Leo Rush, and he was distracting Jack Perry. And at one point, he tripped Jack. Referee saw it. Action Andretti got ejected. So it was one-on-one, Jack Perry and Leo Rush. Leo got in some offense. It was back and forth a little bit. And Perry was able to regain the upper hand. He delivered some Snapdragon suplexes. The commentators brought up Kenny Omega. I wonder if this is maybe a little tease for the future when, when Kenny comes back. Perry got the win, which, obviously, this was a match to rehab Jack Perry after losing at All Out. Comes back, wins a match, although beating Leo Rush. Does that really say much? I don't know. But Jack Perry won, and then he stormed off and left in his scapegoat bus. We had Renee Paquette talking to Hangman Adam Page. Page said that if he found 1,000 houses that belonged to Swerve Strickland, he would have burned each and every one of them. He said he meant everything he said, and now he's going to focus on anybody that helped Swerve. He started walking backstage, looking at different people, and then Jeff Jarrett got in his face. Page ended up attacking Jarrett. He had Karen Jarrett, his wife, and other wrestlers there to break it up. I guess Jeff Jarrett's back to being a good guy this week, and he'll be the next guy fed to hangman out of Page for the time being. We had Private Party and Commander set for a trios match against three guys. I, w- I wasn't even sure who they were, but we didn't really have a match because the Blackpool Combat Club, or whatever they're being called now, they hijacked the match. They showed up, Moxley, Claudio, Pack. They beat down all the guys in the ring, and for some reason, even though they're heels, John Moxley and Claudio were wearing white T-shirts. You only wear white T-shirts for one of two reasons. One, you're a baby face, you wear white. Or two, you're about to do a blade job. And even though John Moxley likes to bleed, there was no blade job here. So Pac cut a promo on behalf of the group. He said that AEW is broken and the company is theirs. We still don't know where this is going, if there's a so-called higher power involved. Why is AEW broken? Why do they think AEW is broken? They haven't really explained anything, so we're kind of left to guess where this is going at this point. A lot of people think it's still leading to Shane McMahon. I don't know. But there's more. Stay tuned. We had Chris Jericho. With the uh, Learning Tree Group, whatever they're called at this point, Big Bill and, and the Bad Apple, Brian Keith, they arrived in a convertible, a Bentley, that said, hi guys, on the license plate. You know what happens when somebody arrives to the arena in a fancy car? Typically, something happens. So they show up, and Jericho's once again bitching about his $7,000 jacket, but he said that he stole Orange Cassidy's backpack, and he found something in the backpack. Next up, we had Ricochet versus Sammy Guevara. Sammy Guevara, who, ever since the incident with Jeff Hardy earlier this year, has been demoted. He recently came back, but he rarely appears on Dynamite now. He does have a an ROH tag title with Dustin Rhodes, but he's down the card now, so you know this is just a showcase match for Ricochet. It was pretty competitive, though, and they fought on the outside. They fought by the stage. Sammy jumped off the top of the tunnel um, with a moonsault. Uh, the referee just let this go, didn't bother counting them out. And then after the break, Ricochet launched himself off the barricade onto Sammy, got him back in the ring, but Sammy regained the upper hand with a destroyer, came off the top of the cutter. Ricochet was able to kick out, and then Ricochet avoided both the shooting star press and the go to hell and picked up the win with his new finisher called the Vertigo. And no, I did not see collision, so I just assumed Chris Jericho stole the backpack at some point. And the crowd was chanting flip forever, so they were enjoying it. It was a good match. Was it anything better than a Ricochet match at WWE? No, but it was good. It was a good match. Ricochet wins. We're just waiting for the inevitable match with Will Ospreay. More on Ospreay in just a few moments. After the match was over, the Beast Mortos attacked Ricochet and then Sammy Guevara. Good guy, Sammy, made the save for Ricochet with a steel chair. We had 
Okada backstage, who's the Continental Champion, and he was doing his fake crying, actually said it was easy to win that four-way all out, and then Don Callis showed up with Takeshita and pointed out that Takeshita was not the one pinned in that match, and Takeshita deserves another one-on-one title opportunity. Okada responded by calling Don Callis a bitch and walked off. Darby Allen came to the ring. He wanted to, to answer or hear out John Moxley, whatever John Moxley had to say. So John Moxley and Marina Shafir came down. Moxley showed that he had no weapons, that he was just there to talk, and Darby said that both of them came from nothing. He said that he wanted to be just like John Moxley, and he got to know the guy on the independent scene, but he doesn't want to be John Moxley anymore. He didn't like what Moxley did to Brian. Darby said he would never do something to that to a friend of his, like Sting, for example. And then he wanted to know what John wanted. And what John wanted was Darby Allen's world title match at Grand Slam. He said Darby is not ready to be world champion, and he can't explain it right now, but he needs Darby to hand over the title shot. Darby responded by, by asking if Moxley was drinking again, making a reference to Moxley's real-life issues, but I'm sure Moxley was cool with that. Darby told Moxley to do something, and Moxley proposed a match where Darby puts the world title shot on the line, and Moxley said, trust him, Darby has no idea what's going on, and he said he's going to get less in the hard way. Darby did accept the match, and Andrew says, why would Darby even accept this? Well, we all know Darby has more guts than brains. That is Darby Allen in a nutshell. So AEW doing a rare pivot where they hyped up Darby Allen getting this world title match at Grand Slam, and now Darby's putting his title opportunity on the line against John Moxley. So anybody that wanted to see Brian versus Darby for the title, well, it may not happen now, but we'll see what happens at Grand Slam. I don't see Moxley losing. Could they potentially do some sort of draw that leads to a three-way? Maybe. I was always thinking we were going to see Brian Danielson versus either Swerve or Darby at Wrestle Dream because the show's in Tacoma, Washington, and it would be the, the home state guys going against each other for the title. But I don't know. We'll see what happens with that. I'm moderate, moderately intrigued. You know, Moxley's saying, like, you have no idea what's going on, and that he has to trust him. Something big is happening here. We'll see. I'll, I'll wait a little bit and, and see where this is going. Maybe this is all leading up to something significant. Time will tell. We had Nigel McGuinness showing up, and he told Christopher Daniels um, that he wanted to have a talk with Tony Khan. More on that in a little bit. We had Mariah May, the women's champion, versus Queen Emanata in a singles match. Your one women's match of the evening. Good match. Obviously, Queen Emanata is not winning here, but it was fine for what it was. It was basically a showcase match for Mariah May. Uh, Mariah picked up the win with the glamour knee, and then the Storm Zero. Then after the match was over, she had a promo, and she said that somebody is missing from her world title, her world title celebration, and that person was Shirakawa. She wants her to come back. There you go. We're stalling for time until we get the Mariah May versus Tony Storm rematch. No Tony Storm on the on the show, and uh, no Mercedes Monet for that matter. I have to say, I didn't, I didn't even think about Mercedes Monet. That's how far her stock has dropped. Like the, the message in the chat room from Matthew, I literally did not think of Mercedes Monet the entire time I was watching Dynamite. I didn't think like, oh, where is she? Is she gonna cut a promo? Is she gonna have a match? Didn't think about Mercedes at all. Make that what you will. So we had Chris Jericho and the Bad Apple and Big Bill in a trios match against the Iron Savages, the Ass Munchers, whatever you want to call them. Horrified squash match. Jericho wrestled in his jacket and won the match in his jacket. Easy win for them. And then afterwards, Jericho cut a promo. And he said in the backpack of Orange Cassidy, he found a picture of the best friends. Poor Orange Cassidy, still remembering his, his friends from back in the day. No more best friends. And Jericho said there's no friends in wrestling. And if you have a friend, they're probably just using you. And uh, we had both Big Bill and Brian Keith give Chris Jericho a little look there, which was funny. And then Jericho demanded that Orange Cassidy pay him the $7,000 for ruining his jacket four years ago during the pandemic. Orange Cassidy appeared on the big screen, said he did not have all the money on him, but his boys were bringing the rest of the cash. We had Mark Briscoe and Kyle O'Reilly, and they showed up with a dump truck, and they went right up to the car, the Bentley, and uh, sure enough, just like when Stone Cold poured the cement in Mr. McMahon's Corvette, they dumped $7,000 in change into Chris Jericho's car, and uh, yeah, Jericho was freaking out, of course. Orange Cassidy went over and uh, made sure he got exact change. It was cute, I guess is the word, but not sure that I think this hit the way they were all thinking it would. It had a little bit of humor to it, but didn't really pack the punch of some of these other segments. Like, you want to see the car completely destroyed. And then this was more of like a little laid-back comedic thing. Although, I guess that falls in line with Orange Cassidy, right? You know, he does the, the orange kicks and, and, and that stuff. So maybe this was supposed to be Orange Cassidy's little little version of that. You know, Orange Cassidy coming out instead of the pyro, he gets the little, the little sparkle. So instead of the cement or the car being smashed or whatever, they just dump points into it. So the Young Bucks got a promo, and uh, they, they hyped up how they are the tag team division. They wished luck to all the teams in the gauntlet match. We also had Hook challenging Roderick Strong for the FTW title. I don't care about that. Nigel McGuinness was in the ring, and he said that since there's no AEW title match at Grand Slam now, he had an idea. So he went to Tony Khan, got a contract. He said that Brian Danielson is afraid of him, and they can now have the one match everybody wants to see. He said Oasis will play him to the ring, but will Brian Danielson join him to the final countdown? Challenges, and he got the contract from Tony Khan to a match at AEW Grand Slam. I'm happy for Nigel McGuinness that he's wrestling again, but... I never watched Ring of Honor, so I have no emotional investment in this whatsoever. Unless you were watching Ring of Honor 20 years ago, whenever they were feuding, I don't know how you would really care about this other than, hey, the announcer guy is going to come out of retirement, or you know, the guy that, um, the only stuff I ever saw of Nigel McGuinness was when he was in TNA. 
wrestling Kurt Angle. That, that's all I know him from. Never really saw him wrestling Ring of Honor, so I don't have the emotional attachment to it. The crowd was kind of flat for the segment. I think they were respectful, but um, they didn't seem too into it. I'm sure they'll have a good match. It's, it's filler for Brian. Brian's going to win, but hey, it's, it's one of his bucket list things. Nigel gets to have one more big match, so cool. I'm sure it'll be entertaining. I'm still wondering the whole deal with changing the world title match, but maybe this is all part of a bigger plan that they have. We had our main event, which was the tag team Casino Gauntlet. Winning team faces the Young Bucks at Grand Slam. We started off with FTR and Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher. They went at it for a bit. Then we had the Righteous, the Kingdom, the Acclaimed, Mace and Mansoor coming out there. I think this was their first Dynamite appearance, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they like to uh, touch the tips, and they came out there, and they, they, uh, they had a couple moments. We'll see if this leads to something bigger for them. We then had Top Flight out there, and Will Ospreay and Dante Martin went back at it for a little bit. Then we had FTR hit the Shadow Machine, but all the other teams came in, broke up a pin attempt. Then we had the Outrunners come out. The, the few times I've watched Collision, I, I've seen the Outrunners, and basically what their gimmick is, is they're a throwback to the 1980s. You know, they're always posing, uh, they kind of look like Hulk Hogan, they're muscular, you know, they're like Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage in a way. You know, they're out there, they're flexing, they're hamming it up for the camera, uh, you know, they're the bodybuilders. Uh, so they're very much like an 80s throwback tag team. They're pretty entertaining, I, I will say. Uh, so they're coming out there, they're cleaning house, and dare I say, like, they were one of the most over acts on the entire show. Uh, they're, they're like a cult favorite right now, and uh, I wonder if they're going to actually amount to something here. Like, this was their biggest match today. Uh, then we had the Grizzled Young Veterans come out there, but uh, FTR met them on the stage. The teams got into a brawl. They fought to the backstage area, and uh, that was the last we saw of both teams. We didn't see Grizzled Young Veterans at all. FTR was gone, and uh, then back in the ring, Outrunners almost won the match, but uh, the pin was broken up, I think by the Kingdom or somebody, one of those other teams. Then um, Dante Martin got hit with a pin blade by Will Ospreay, and Kyle Fletcher made the cover, got the 1-2-3 victory. Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher get the tag team title match with the Young Bucks at Grand Slam. Maybe this is when we're finally going to get the split. Like, Osprey has still been affiliated with Don Callis, even though he's a babyface. Um, so maybe this will finally be where something goes wrong. I don't see them winning the tag. They, they really need to split these guys, right? So this may finally be where the split happens. And uh, it was a very good match to close out the show. The casino gauntlet matches are always really good. And uh, this was no exception. Uh, Dynamite was, was solid. I, I'd probably go with a B- minus for the show. I did like the main event. The Moxie stuff. I'm mildly intrigued by it. I'm going to give it time, see where it goes. Um, they, they changed some things up for Grand Slam. Grand Slam's looking pretty good, though. We got three matches now set for that show. We got Brian Danielson versus Nigel, which, like I said, will be a good match. We got the Young Bucks versus Osprey and Fletcher. That'll be a great match. Maybe we'll get an angle there. Maybe we'll get the turn, the split between Osprey and Fletcher. Then we got uh, Moxley versus Darby Allen, which, again, I can see that maybe going multiple ways. I, I just don't see Moxley losing, but maybe it's a draw. Maybe there's a DQ or something. We'll have to see what happens. The crowd wasn't the best, you know, it was another fairly small crowd, I think like 3,000 people in a 15,000 seat arena in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, next week it's Chris Jericho versus Orange Cassidy. We'll see what happens with that. I'm still waiting for Renzo Amore to come back, but I'm not, not expecting anything. So that's all I got for tonight. Thank you all so much. I will be back on Friday night after SmackDown. SmackDown moves to the USA Network. Make sure you guys tune in for that. Stay tuned to NoDQ.com for all the latest news and rumors. Buy a shirt, NoDQ.com slash merch. Support the site. Say yes to NoDQ, and I will see you all next time.